focus on headline. Now let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio today, we have our reporters in Yoon Hae-jung and Chung Yein. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening to you guys. We're going to start things off with South Korea having kicked off its largest ever defense exhibition on Tuesday. This, of course, being the Seoul International Aerospace and Defense Exhibition, or ADEX for short. Uh, this in order to boost exports of its latest weapons and technologies. We've been talking about how South Korea has been really pushing to uh, export a lot of their military wares. Uh, this featured on the very first day aerial displays of the homegrown KF-21 fighter jet. Uh, this, I believe, was the first time they displayed it in public. You have strategic bomber B-52 arriving in South Korea. There was a performance on that. Uh, Hejong, you're going to start us off with the start of the ADEX. Tell us more. Sure. The Seoul International Aerospace and Defense Exhibition is held at Seoul Air Base in Seongnam, Gyeonggi Province, just south of Seoul. It kicked off today and it runs until Sunday, involving 550 companies from 35 countries. The first four days will host various seminars and forums for defense industry officials before the exhibition is open to the general public for the last two days. And according to the co-organizing committee, this is the 14th edition of the biennial event launched in 1996, and the 2023 event marks the largest ever edition in terms of the number of ex exhibitors and visitors as well as the exhibition area. The event has 2,320 booths this year and is expected to draw some 300,000 visitors compared to the 120,000 at the last show. With 550 companies from 35 countries as exhibitors, with over 114 military and defense officials visiting from 55 countries. And compared to the last show, the number of exhibits has also increased from 60 to more than 100. South Korean fighter jets such as the KF-21, F-35A Stealth, F-15K, and F-A-50 will be on display, as well as U.S. military aircraft such as the F-22, which is considered the world's most powerful stealth fighter, and the EA-18G Growler, an American carrier-based electronic warfare aircraft, also being one of the world's best electronic warfare systems, is displayed to the Korean public for the first time. And South Korea's homegrown KF-21 fighter jet conducted a demonstration flight in its public, public debut, which was joined by U.S. military aircraft, including the F-22 stealth jet, to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the bilateral alliance this year. The nuclear-capable B-52 bomber also flew over the airbase, demonstrating Washington's commitment to security on the Korean Peninsula. And although the B-52 is considered a key strategic asset, having been deployed to joint drills between Seoul and Washington, it will mark the first time that one has landed at a South Korean airbase. And Yein will have more on this, but during the opening ceremony, President Yoon seok yeol pledged to provide support for the country's defense industry, mentioning that South Korea, a country which had relied on international aid and imports in the past, has leaped to become an exporter of cutting-edge fighter plans. Planes. Yeah, again, uh, the landing of the B-52 bombers, uh, the U.S. B-52 bombers, is quite significant because I think a lot of people are like, wait a minute, it's the first time it's ever landed. Yeah, it has kind of flown over the Korean Peninsula on a multiple occasions on a lot of these uh, joint uh, air drills with the South Korean Air Force, but it's the first time that it's landed. I believe mm -hmm. it's landed in an uh, air base in Cheongju, which is uh, some 112 kilometers uh, southeast of Seoul. And uh, obviously, we've mentioned before, uh, North Korea, not a big fan of the B-52 bombers. Uh, it's because, <laughs> as uh, uh, she mentioned, uh, it's uh, nuclear capable. Mm -hmm. And uh, North Korea is continue going to, continuously going to say that this is uh, another sign of invasion tactics that's uh, being launched by the United States. And being that it's landed now on South Korea, they're going to probably uh, raise more issues on the front as well. Well, as uh, uh, Hejong had hinted, uh, we have President Yoon seok yeol taking part in the opening ceremony with a speech at the ADEX 2023. And uh, he also said that Korea's defense industry is writing a new history by creating something out of nothing, he said. Uh, Ain, let's get more on this. 
Yes, so attracting some 550 exhibitors from 35 countries, the 14th and the largest ADEX ever, kicked off with congratulatory remarks from President Yoon at Seoul Air Base in Songnam City. Now, recognizing how Korea used to be an aid recipient country and relied on imports uh, in the past, but has become a producer slash exporter of state-of-the-art fighter jets now, uh, President Yoon called weapons made in Korea, uh, such as KF 21, FA-50, AMSAM, and LSAM, quote, the products of your passion and challenges when addressing the Korean public during his speech. He continued to mention each of the proud Korean weapon products, including the K-9 Thunder uh, self-propelled howitzer, which accounts uh, now for half of the world's self-propelled artillery market, the World Tier Tank K-2 Black Panther, uh, the combat infantry fighting vehicle Redback, which has been selected as the preferred third choice for the Australian Army's next-generation armored vehicle, and the multiple rocket launcher Chunmu, uh, while reiterating that they are all the future of the Korean defense industry. His remarks were intended to promote the excellence of Korean defense capability as the exhibition was attended by 116 delegations from 57 countries, including senior military officials, CEOs of defense companies, and defense market buyers. Uh, so Yoon's view on the defense industry was that it has now a uh, it is now uh, a national strategic industry, which is the foundation of Korea's security and economy. Noting that defense cooperations are now expanding beyond the export of weapons uh, to further include the supply of equipment and parts, uh, education and training, and research and development, he highlighted the government's commitment to enhance its global competitiveness by providing adequate ecosystem and to build a defense and security cooperation system with uh, Korea's friendly countries. He also shared the government's plan to nurture Korean aerospace industry, centering around the Korea Aerospace Administration, or CASA, uh, which was proposed by the Yoon administration with a special bill back in April. Now, President Yoon's plan to provide uh, policy support for the development of the industry and to accelerate uh, building the AI foundation of the military force was laid out in his speech today once again. Were you getting emotional with his speech? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a big moment. Yeah, for maybe it was. Maybe I was. It is, a moment. <laughs> it is a momentous moment for all of us here in South Korea. No, it's, it's, it's fascinating, really, because a lot of these... Uh, uh, hardware that you just talked about, the the, the K9 Thunder self-propelled howitzer, the K2 Black Panther, the uh, the combat infantry fighting vehicle Redback. These were, I believe, a uh, showcased uh, last year at a uh, a defense exhibition expo uh, over in oh my goodness, where was it? I think it was maybe in Ilsan, uh in Kintex mm -hmm. last year, and there was a number of defense ministers from different countries that came to check out some of these weaponry, and Poland was one of the countries that were fascinated uh, with the weapons that were being built by South Korea, which mm -hmm. is why they uh, ordered a, a huge amount of this. And what they were also very much fascinated was the fact that right after they ordered it, in about a few months, they received their first order shipments uh, of these, uh, like the K-9 howitzers and so forth. And so they were saying not only is it great for its price, uh, also they're able to build this very quickly. And so the future of South Korea's whip weapon export is going to be huge, huge moving forward here. Uh, you also have, speaking of defense, the South Korea's defense ministry hosting an annual international defense forum in Seoul, which started on this Tuesday. Uh, the Seoul Defense Dialogue, uh, this aims to facilitate talks on promoting peace and cooperation against regional and global security challenges. Uh, Hejung, let's get more on this. Sure. The Seoul Defense Dialogue is being held at the Grand Intercontinental Parnas Hotel in Seoul for three days starting the 17th. The Multilateral Security Conference will bring together some 800 high-level security officials and civil experts from 56 countries, as well as NATO and the European Union, including minister-level officials from Australia, Malaysia, Mongolia, Brunei, and Fiji. Launched in 2012 to contribute to peace on the Korean Peninsula and promote security cooperation in the region, this year's theme for the 12th uh, edition of the Seoul Defense Dialogue is Cooperation and Solidarity for Freedom, Peace, and Prosperity. 
Now, this theme aims to explore ways for the international community to jointly respond to the rapidly changing security environment, including the war in Ukraine, strategic rivalries between major countries, uh, as well as non-traditional security threats such as climate change and the recent invasion of Israel by Hamas. Now, today on the first day of the dialogue, the Defense Ministry hosted the Cybersecurity Working Group Forum. The cyber talks were attended by over 180 officials from 30 countries, such as the U.S., Japan, Germany, as well as NATO officials. The Space Security Working Group Forum was also held today, with more than 150 government and private sector experts from 37 countries, including the U.S., Germany, France, and India. Discussions were aimed to raise collective awareness of the military use of space and the increasing threats it poses, as well as to share policies and strategies of advanced space nations. The forum will hold an opening ceremony on Wednesday, which is tomorrow, and three key plenary sessions and four special sessions will take place. The discussion topics will range from the international community's response to North Korea's escalating nuclear threats, efforts for a prosperous Indo-Pacific region, and the military use of AI technology, as well as the significance of the 70th anniversary of the Korean War armistice. In the meantime, South Korea, the U.S., and Japan having completed the establishment of the hotline uh, in accordance with the pledge to consult with one another during regional crises uh, announcement announced at the trilateral summit uh, this back in August. Uh, it remains to be seen when the hotline will actually be activated and with what agenda uh, amid the growing tensions between Israel and Hamas. It seems like the U.S. is pretty much... Uh, busy, have their hands tied with this uh, issue right now. And there's also speculation that North Korea and China may take advantage of the situation over in Middle East. Um, Yane, let's get more on this. So it was during a South Korean senior government official's phone interview with Yonhap News Agency today that he revealed setting up the trilateral hotline is now complete and the countries have run technical testings already. So the hotline is established by the National Security Councils of the three countries and it will allow the three leaders and their national security chiefs to conduct voice and video communications at any time. So the White House Security Council spokesperson also said that it is improving communications capabilities among the three countries to ensure sufficient access to secure voice slash video communications lines on a regular and timely basis. So the hotline was built, uh, as said, uh, on the pledges uh, for mutual consultation in times of common threat, uh, which was agreed to at the uh, Camp Davis summit back in August. So the leaders agreed to form the hotline so as to quickly share information and coordinate closely when any threat or crisis occurs in the region. So now that the installation of the system has been finalized, uh, the question now is when it will actually be operated. The leaders of the three countries adopted a document on crisis consultations at their August summit, but did not specifically define what this crisis or threat truly means. So in this context, if the three countries actually um, activate this hotline and conduct consultations at any point, that will serve as a good signpost to see what kind of agenda the trilateral crisis consultations will cover going forward and at what level. Furthermore, there are observations that the launch of the trilateral hotline between South Korea and Japan, uh, though with the U.S. uh, is now involved, could mark a new milestone in South Korea-Japan relations as a means that the two countries will also directly discuss security issues. In the meantime, we have North Korea reaffirming its long-held but uh, usual stance at the UN that Pyongyang will not give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, You also had former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea, Harry Harris, uh, who called for strengthened nuclear deterrence for South Korea amid the continuous threats uh, from North Korea. Hedging, let's get more on this. Well, it's not a big surprise that North Korea is once again unwilling to let go of its nuclear weapons. During the first committee of the United Nations General Assembly meeting on Monday, the North Secretary for North Korea's permanent mission to the UN, Kim in tae said Pyongyang will not give up its nuclear weapons as it faces continuous threats from the United States. Kim said that the U.S. continues to deploy nuclear assets to the Korean Peninsula, which are disguised with claims of being 
being defensive in nature. He also added that the U.S. continues to conduct nuclear weapons tests despite its condemnation of North Korea's nuclear ambitions and that it has been accelerating a nuclear arms race. Both Seoul and Tokyo denounced Pyongyang's nuclear ambitions as well, calling for the North to give up its nuclear weapons and return to the table for dialogue. Now, meanwhile, during a uh, virtual seminar, former U.S. ambassador to South Korea, Harry Harris, called for the U.S. to keep strengthening its extended deterrence commitment to South Korea, as he stressed that North Korea's evolving military threats are far greater than before. Harris said that the North has been doubling down on its nuclear missile programs under an aggressive nuclear policy stipulated in its constitution. However, the former ambassador said it would be a mistake to redeploy U.S. tactical nuclear arms to the Korean Peninsula. And Harris, who served from 2018 to 2021, also raised concerns about technological cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow. You had a chance to uh, watch uh, the the UN message by uh, Kim in char and uh, he, he really went at it against mm-hmm. the United States. I mean, there was a little bit mentioned in regards to South Korea, but most of it was basically on the United States and basically saying that, why are you guys always attacking us for making, a, uh, you know, taking nuclear tests? Uh, they've already conducted six nuclear tests, right? And they've been uh, faced with a number of UN Security Council resolutions because of that. And they're saying basically, hey, the United States are testing nuclear weapons all the time. What makes it okay for them to do it and not us? And uh, the I believe he also raised uh, issues about a lot of these uh, uh, annual military drills that are being conducted by the United States and South Korea again they are going to continue to say that this is going to be uh, a practice for their future invasion is what they're saying but th- the message by Harry Harris one that I found interesting was he also said that according to him a uh, number of US allies don't really trust the US too much with their quote unquote <laughs> extended deterrent so what this means is that if there's no trust amongst the allies then these allied countries are start going to start to want to make their own nuclear weapons mm-hmm. and that is actually the situation right now where because Uh, About earlier this year, up until earlier this year, there was talks about South Korea really pushing to maybe one day have their own nuclear weapons. But of course, that was kind of shot down by Washington and so forth. And then Seoul basically said, "Nah, you know, this is not going to happen. But that is exactly what we're seeing at this time. And so the U.S. is going, listen, we need to continue to have this extended deterrence over the Korean Peninsula so that we prevent more nuclear weapons being put in. But he also did say, like you said, uh, he's against uh, nuclear assets mm-hmm. being put into South Korea. So that's that. Uh, we have Russian ship Angara suspected of being used by North Korea and Russia to trade ammunitions and other weapons. Uh, it's been confirmed as a target of sanctions by the U.S. and U.K. governments. Uh, there has been reports that two ships uh, from Russia have been going back and forth about five times so far. Yane, let's get the latest on this. Yes, so for Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. Departments of Treasury and State imposed a slew of sanctions on a number of individuals and entities in Russia, and now this includes the Russian ship Angara. So the Russian shipping company M. Leasing, which is the owner of the ship, and two other ships owned by the company, Adler and Askelon, are also subject to these sanctions. Uh, the, state of the, uh, the State Department's explanation was that M. Leasing a Moscow-based entity is transporting arms for the Russian government with its ships. Uh, The UK government also announced sanctions against M uh, M Leasing back in May, saying the company, quote, operates in the transportation sector, which is of strategic importance to the Russian government and is involved in providing financial services that could contribute to destabilizing Ukraine or threatening its territorial integrity, sovereignty, or independence. According to the International Maritime Organization, or IMO's Global Integrated Shipping Information System, the vessel's um, country of origin was changed from Germany to Russia in March 2020, and the vessel was renamed the same month. Uh, Marine traffic, uh, this is a site that tracks ship locations around the world, uh, lists Angara's current location as the Sea of Okhotsk. This is a very... um, uh, 
Difficult name. Yeah. Uh, so Russia, that is in Russia. But this is based on data received on August 10th, which is two months ago, obviously. So the ship was spotted on September 12th in the eastern Russian port of Denai in a photo uh, released by the U.S. raising concerns on an alleged arms deal between North Korea and Russia, suggesting that the ship may have turned off its automatic identification system, or AIS. Uh, so an IMO press officer said the guidelines are very clear that AIS must be activated at all times when the ship is underway or at anchor. Uh, the Washington Post reported the previous day that two Russian ships, including Angara, uh, had switched off their AIS system to avoid being tracked before transporting North Korean munitions from the North Korean port of Najin to the Russian port of Dunai. Uh, meanwhile, yesterday, the KCNA in North Korea reported that Sergei Lavrov, uh, foreign minister of of Russia will make an official visit to North Korea on October 18th and 19th at the invitation of its foreign ministry. Now, all in all, turning off the AIS seems to be an indication that the ship is indeed involved in a fishy business. Yeah, not to mention uh, this ship is kind of uh, linked with military logistics systems. And so, and like you said, I mean, if they're going to be uh, turning off their uh, tracking system, there's obviously a reason why they're doing this. But uh, we had a chance to speak with an expert uh, last night, uh, Professor Bruce Bechtel from the Angelo State University, and he raised the issue of how big these containers are. 1,000 containers is what I believe John Kirby had said earlier this week, and 1,000 containers uh, means a whole lot of ammunition is there. And I, there is no clear-cut figure. There's no clear-cut uh, information on what is exactly in the uh, the containers themselves, but the, the speculation is that it's ammunition, and this, of course, is going to continue to prolong uh, the war over in Ukraine is the big concern here. Let's move on to some domestic issues. A revised enforcement ordinance of the Assembly and Demonstration Act went into effect on Tuesday, allowing the police to prohibit rallies near the presidential office. This for traffic control measures. Uh, this measure is now facing criticism that it infringes on rallies participants freedom. Hedging, let's get the latest updates on this. Well, first, for some background, the purpose of the Assembly and Demonstration Act is to achieve an appropriate balance between the guarantees of the right to assemble and public order by protecting the freedom of lawful demonstrations and protecting citizens from unlawful ones. Now, under the new enforcement decree of the Assembly and Demonstration Act, Article 12, 11 streets, including Itaewonno and Sobingoro, have been additionally designated as main streets where police can ban or restrict rallies for, for traffic control purposes. And what's notable is that Itaewonno and Sobingoro run in front, front of the presidential office and near the presidential residence, respectively. The, re the revised decree also excludes 12 existing roads where rallies and protests have not been held in the last five years or where traffic has become relatively smoother than in the past. And it is the first time since 2014 that such a revision has been made. Other revisions include more strict noise control standards for demonstration in residential areas and near schools or general hospitals and public libraries. Now, the inclusion of Itemono in the list of major streets where police have discretionary power to ban rallies has led to, had led some to point out that the government may have revised the law to prevent protests in front of the presidential office as it runs in front of the presidential office. So the police had been resorting to the Act's Article 11, which mandates a ban on rallies with a 100-meter radius of the presidential residence to prohibit demonstrations near the presidential office. And striking down the ban, the Constitutional Court ruled last year that it is an excessive limit that goes beyond the legislative objectives and gave a grace period until May 31st, 2024 to come up with an alternative. So the latest ordinance revision by the police has drawn criticism that the move may be aimed at circumventing the court ruling. Now, civic groups, including a group of progressive lawyers, state that the revision is apparently aimed at explicitly infringing on rally participants' freedom to choose rally locations and gag people protesting against main government institutions. So in response, the police defended the revision as something that aims to keep in pace with the city's 
fast changing traffic conditions and the urban structure, adding that they will fully guarantee the right to assembly and demonstration in accordance with the relevant standards set forth by the court. I mean, you know, not taking any sides, but those roads are pretty <laughs> trafficy. So, I mean, there's been always kind of uh, complaints of traffic in the first place. But when there are massive rallies that do take place, I mean, it's, it's going to cause more concession, right? Uh, moving on here, the government taking measures to stabilize consumer prices. Uh, this including supplying 2,000 tons of cabbage to help make kimchi ahead of winter. It is uh, Kim Jong season is coming up soon and also supporting retailers so that they can give consumers uh, the discounts for sea salts. This was the other big concern because ever since the release of the wastewater uh, from the Fukushima nuclear power plant, there was big concerns that this was going to affect the uh, sea salt as well. And there was people buying bags and bags and bags of sea salt. Uh, Yane, let's get the latest on this. Yes, so at the ministerial meeting on market price stabilization, uh, stabilization held at the government's Seoul office today, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Chu kyung ho said all relevant ministries will do their utmost to stabilize prices for the people by closely checking and responding to prices in their respective areas. Uh, so he assessed that gasoline and diesel prices turned downward for the first time in 14 weeks last week, but the uncertainty with high prices in in the global economy has expanded once again, with international oil prices fluctuating significantly due to the development of the armed conflict between Israel and Hamas. He also added that uncertainty in agricultural prices also persists, with a sharp drop in temperatures in October serving as an upward pressure in vegetable prices. In response, the government plans to supply 2,200 tons of cabbage for two weeks starting this week, uh, and the government will provide technical guidance and free supply of uh, necessary chemicals and nutrients to prepare for the possibility of poor growth due to low temperatures. A total of 1,000 tons of sea salt will be supplied at a 50 percent discount, uh, discounted prices from the end of this month. Already, sea salt has been sold at a 30% discount at large supermarkets since the 12th of this month. So uh, for 12 agricultural products, um, whose prices are apparently unstable, such as cabbages, green onions, and apples, they will be sold at a discount of up to 30% from the 19th. Uh, starting from next week, the government will also support the sale of newly grown rice at a discounted prices. For petroleum products, the government has extended the fuel uh, tax cut and subsidies until the end of this year, and will also strengthen price spot checks by organizing a joint ministry inspection team. You know, I was always uh, curious as to how these uh, distinct discount prices are actually even implemented. But I've actually noticed the difference because the government actually pushed for discount prices on agricultural goods during the uh, the Trusak holiday not too long ago. And I noticed that there was a uh, significant difference in the prices of fruits because, you know, that's what we give during Trusak. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot cheaper this year than uh, compared to uh, last year, for instance. And again, uh, there's a lot of people saying, who's buying all these bags of sea salt uh, over the fear of the wastewater from the Fukushima nuclear power? plan it's again people who do these uh, the annual kim jang uh the making of the kimchi every uh, every winter time right uh let's move on here uh go over to the middle east where u.s president joe biden is set to pay a solidarity visit to israel uh this on wednesday local time this is an effort to mitigate the expansion of the conflict between uh, israel and hamas you have secretary of state anthony blinken who's made two trips to israel since the armed conflict broke out on october 7th uh, announcing biden's upcoming visit during a press conference at the u.s embassy in tel aviv hedge let's get the latest updates on this Sure. After an eight-hour marathon meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and top Israeli officials, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken announced President Biden's Wednesday trip and said that the United States and Israel have agreed to develop a plan that will enable humanitarian aid from donor nations and multilateral organizations to reach civilians in Gaza. 
Blinken also added that the president will reaffirm the U.S. solidarity with Israel and its ironclad commitment to security and that Israel has the right and the duty to defend its people from Hamas and other terrorists. And in a separate briefing, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said that President Biden's travel to Israel was thoroughly evaluated, adding that the president will also travel to Jordan where he would meet with Jordanian King Abdullah II, Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas, and Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. The U.S. president will reiterate the nation's will of wanting to continue to work with all partners in the region, including Israel, to get humanitarian assistance and to provide some sort of safe passage for civilians to get out. Now, during the visit, Biden is also expected to discuss future options, including a two-state solution that would separate Hamas from the Palestinian people, ousting Hamas politically, and establishing an independent Palestinian government. Now, President Biden was initially scheduled to visit Colorado on the 18th to promote his policy achievements in combating climate change, but he canceled the event with only a few hours to go to visit Israel. Now, it is highly unusual for a U.S. president to cancel an event on the day it is held. And on a related note in a CBS interview, President Biden reiterated his full support for Israel, but drew the line at sending U.S. troops. However, uh, the Washington Post, citing military officials, reported that more than 4,000 U.S. Navy personnel are currently scheduled to join the U.S. military fleet near the coast of Israel, and that a third aircraft carrier battle group is in the Mediterranean on its way to Israel. If the U.S. troops get involved with this, it is going to really break out into a full-out war involving multiple, multiple countries out Mm -hmm. there, which I think is the reason why uh, the U.S. has come out openly saying that they're not going to be sending any troops and Mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, And uh, even Biden coming out that he is it would be a big mistake for Israel to occupy Uh, Gaza was the statement that was made. And I I don't think uh, Israel was very keen on those statements, but it was the most politically, I guess, right thing to say for Biden at this time. And now uh, the big concern is whether or not this uh, conflict in the Middle East uh, will ultimately impact the war over in Ukraine is the other issue here. They're all linked. Uh, In the meantime, the third Belt and Road International Cooperation Summit Forum, which marks the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative. This is, of course, the key policy uh, of Chinese President Xi Jinping. Uh, This officially kicked off today on Tuesday. Uh, Yin, let's get the details of this. Right. So this year's summit, uh, this is the third one after 2017 and 2019. Uh, and this is being held in Beijing starting today and will last for two days. This year's theme is building a high quality Belt and Road together, uh, working hand in hand to realize common development and prosperity. Now, more than 4,000 experts and officials from 140 countries, as well as 30 international organizations are expected to attend. A business convention and welcoming reception is held on the 17th, uh, and the opening ceremony will be held on the second day, which is tomorrow. Uh, President Xi Jinping, uh, he is uh, being the host of the summit. Uh, He will deliver his opening remarks uh, tomorrow, where he is expected to look back on 10 years of the initiative and outline its future plans. In addition to the opening ceremony, the second day will feature high-level forums on interconnection, green development, and digital economy, as well as six special forums on trade, communication with people, think tank exchanges, the Silk Road, and local and maritime cooperation. The forum is likely to release uh, several documents on the future direction of the Belt and Road Initiative as well. Particular attention is, of course, being paid to the meeting between Russian President Vladimir Putin and uh, Chinese President Xi, as Putin has just traveled to China attend, uh, to attend attend the summit. Uh, Xi and Putin, who will be meeting for the second time this year following their summit in March, are expected to clarify their commitment to keeping the U.S. in check, as well as their stance on some burning global issues, such as the Israeli-Hamas armed conflict. Like, the, the relationship that 
China and Russia has is it's very, very complicated. And I think Russia is very much confused as what kind of relationship they have, because again, traditionally, right, they're, they're allies, mm -hmm. uh, this along with uh, North Korea. But China is kind of playing differently. You have Russia and North Korea definitely cooperating. And according to reports, if the reports are true that there's already being arms trade uh, being exchanged between the two sides there, they're definitely cooperating on this front. But China has, I think, made it clear uh, from time and time out that they're not going to get involved with supplying Russia with any weapons uh, to fuel the Ukraine war. And so the big question now is what kind of support are you? Number one, why invite Putin in the foot? first place? What kind of message is China trying to deliver by inviting Putin? What are they going to discuss? I'm sure that they're going to be talking about their friendly relations and so forth. But it's not reciprocal at this time. China is really not helping out uh, Russia because they know that they need to take care for themselves. And if they do any kind of assistance uh, towards Moscow, that they're going to be further mm -hmm. isolated. And China has already been isolated for, for years now because of this trade war between the United States. And so we'll find out once the summit does take place between President Xi Jinping and uh, President Vladimir Putin. We'll find out what kind of messages are exchanged and how this is going to also uh, impact us. But of course, we'll also talk about this more with uh, Professor Chu Jiu, uh, who is going to be connecting with us in the second hour of the show. Guys, thank you very much for coming in with your reports. Have a safe rest of your night, and we'll see you guys again. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.